Consigning the jungle to history, work resumes in the French port of Calais to remove the infamous refugee camp. The process was halted earlier when authorities were overwhelmed by the amount of people needing to be relocated. Lives on the line. Women and children are among those dodging constant shelling and sniper fire from extremists as they try to flee eastern Aleppo. However, bombs and bullets aren't the only concern in the region. If you know what you are looking for, you may be able to tell that there's something odd about these children. And there is. They all have cancer. With sanctions on Syria still firmly locked in place, hope fades for children suffering from cancer with severe restrictions on vital drugs. Plus, amid fears of a serious terrorist threat, German police sweep across several regions in a large-scale anti-terror operation. This is RT International Live from Moscow. I'm Marina Joshi. Now, French authorities have resumed the demolition of the infamous jungle refugee camp in the French port of Calais. Earlier, they halted the process after chaos broke out when thousands of migrants tried to reach buses and leave the site. Well, you're looking right now at live pictures from the camp. And tents are being taken down, and migrants are gathering again to get onto buses that will take them to their new homes in France. Overnight, though, there were fierce clashes in the jungle. Artist Harry Fear is in Cali for us. So, Harry, bring us up to date on what's going on in the camp right now. Marina, a very good afternoon to you from the center of Calais. Well, we understand now then that in the last half an hour or so, officially the demolition process has begun. It is now, of course, day two of this process of closing down the infamous so called jungle camp has been so controversial and its conditions have got no better in the last couple of months with several thousand if not ten thousand living in often squalid conditions and the plight especially there of the up to 1,300 unaccompanied minors has also been very miserable too. We know that some were transported from Calais yesterday on these official transports organized by the French government, but that many others are still unaccounted for. And one of the main fears at present then is that as this demolition process begins and is ongoing tonight and in the coming days, what actually will be the safeguarding of the welfare of those hundreds of children left? Well, the charity and aid groups are very worried. Take a listen. As such, the most vulnerable group, the under-13s, are being forced to remain in the Calais camp itself amidst all the confusion and chaos. This chaotic setup is extremely distressing and confusing for the lone miners, the youngest of which is eight years old. The younger children are struggling to understand where they're supposed to go and how they're supposed to get there. And indeed, my gosh, has there been so much bad organization and miscommunication. The words of some of the aid workers we were speaking to earlier, there was queues of people men, children queuing even for several hours yesterday to be registered in the center there beside the Calais camp. Children today being forced to sit on the floor by French police dressed in riot gear, sitting on the mud, in some cases apparently also tearing their clothes and then charity workers having to go around and hand out food and also having to hand out proper adequate materials even for the children to be sitting on. So certainly not a very smoothly running historical uh, operation so far now, as I say, on day two. But what we've been hearing from the French government, and particularly the interior minister, is that they think so far it's been going rather well. Mm. Well, Harry, indeed a dramatic situation there for the kids, as uh, you've uh, told us and as we have seen there. Thanks for bringing us up to date on what's happening in Calais right now as we speak.
Well, and activists estimate that around a thousand unaccompanied children are currently staying in the jungle. Over a hundred minors went missing during a partial demolition of a camp in February. And there are mounting fears more children will be lost from the books this time. UKIP MEP Bill Etheridge says it's friends which let the situation get out of control. It's on their soil. They've allowed these people to congregate in an area where they have only one aim, and that is to enter the UK illegally. This should have not ever got to this point. The French should have done, uh, taken action many, many months ago to, to deal with this issue. It's absolutely absurd that they've allowed this to carry on. When they clear the camp, they've got to go in there and formally identify who these people are, and if they are children, give them priority and make sure that they are cared for and taken into care properly and not just left in those appalling conditions. And the, the conditions I witnessed in Calais were absolutely abysmal, not the kind of thing you would allow anyone to live in a civilised country in the 21st century. It was terrible. In neighboring Italy, locals from a town in the north of the country have been protesting over a decision to relocate migrants close to them. All entry points to the town have been barricaded to prevent migrants from arriving, and many parents have also temporarily stopped their children going to school in another form of protest. We're not protesting because we're racists. We understand the situation, but our region is isolated. We don't have anything. We've been developing an area to attract tourists, but tomorrow we won't have this place because it was given to migrants. Is this normal? It's the only place people can stay when they visit the seaside. This is absurd. Despite constant shelling from rebel-held eastern Aleppo, Syrians are still risking their lives on a daily basis in a bid to reach the government-controlled side of the city. And during uh, the past 24 hours, almost 50 locals, mostly women and children, have used humanitarian corridors in a bid to reach safety and be reunited with their families. However, it's not only bombing raids that children in the war-torn city need to be wary of. For those suffering from illness, sanctions are only making matters worse. Earlier this month, a UN report strongly criticizing Western sanctions on Syria was leaked to the online publication The Intercept. The measures were imposed on the country back in 2011 in an attempt to force President Assad to step down. They include trade restrictions, uh, bans on oil exports and banking, and also freezing of government assets. The report revealed the sanctions have mostly harmed Syrian civilians and obstructed the work of aid organizations as uh, the procedures discouraged many organizations from providing humanitarian relief to the country. Even the UN itself was having problems exporting items for basic human needs as well as vital medication. Artis Maragis DF reports from the scene. If you know what you're looking for, you may be able to tell that there's something odd about these children. And there is. They all have cancer. And many of them are dying from forms of cancer that are perfectly treatable. Just not here. Selling cancer medicine to Syria is a criminal act thanks to European and American sanctions or any other life-saving drugs too, for the matter, or even medical equipment, and children are dying for it. They're brave, and they'll need to be. Of the roughly 200 children with cancer in Aleppo, 30 have died, and only nine have survived the disease. Almost all the children who've died of cancer have done so because of European sanctions. We asked the European Union and humanitarian agencies to lift the sanctions and let cancer medicine in because children are suffering. For four years, Europe has ignored those pleas. 
and the casualties among the innocent are mounting. This is three-year-old Wafa. She had eye cancer. They could have treated it, but Western sanctions made getting the medicine impossible. And the only hospital that specialized in cancer in Aleppo, Kindi Hospital, was taken by rebels and destroyed in fighting. They had to amputate her eye, but she's fine now. She lived. Many other kids won't. For a year, she lived with an empty eye socket until this organization, Cancer Care Syria, saved enough money to buy her a new one. It changed her life. She said, look at me, I have my second eye. Now nobody will stare at me strangely. CCS doesn't get international grants or media headlines. They don't boast. They just save and enhance lives as best they can. I like to help them. I have a lot of friends here. I love them and they love me. This little girl, Kamar, also has cancer, though no one tells her. She only knows that she's a little sick. Kamar thinks she comes here to help suffering children, but they too help her. When the war began, we dreamt of opening a specialized children's cancer hospital. But we don't have that sort of money. We don't even have $6,000 a month for medicine for the children. That's all they need to treat hundreds of children in Aleppo. And they struggle each month to collect that tiny sum. They buy and smuggle cancer medicine from Lebanon. Then there's food. Even with medicine, the children need enough food or they won't survive. It's what all the mothers think about, having enough food for the children. They look happy here, but bear this in mind. A year from now, some of these kids will be gone. Morad Gazdiev, Ati, in Aleppo.